Have you ever seen those Russian doll sets where you basically open one up and there's another one and then you open that one up and there's another one and it goes on forever? That's basically your muscle tissue. So today we're talking about muscle histology, tissue study of the muscles. So we're going to subdivide it all the way from whole muscle all the way down into the smallest contractile unit. So if we understand how the microscopic structure of the muscle works, we understand how the whole muscle structure works. So it's absolutely fascinating. So let's get rolling. This is Organized Biology. Excited to have you with us. So we're going to start with the big subdivision. We're looking at a macro version of the muscle. So we know skeletal muscles specifically are attached to bone tissue via tendon. So here's our tendon right here. And tendons are dense, irregular connective tissue, very strong in one direction. And the reason they need to be strong, attaching muscles to bones, is because muscles can generate a lot, a lot of force. That's how we move our bones and can lift things and run and all those types of things. So tendons don't really get ruptured all that easily, although if they do get torn, they don't heal very easily. So I want you to write, don't heal well. The reason for that is because they don't have a very good blood supply. However, if you tear a muscle, so say the actual muscle tissue gets torn, the muscle has a lot of capillaries, blood supply, so it heals relatively rapidly if it gets torn up. Okay, so let's look at the muscle itself. So we're just gonna say this is a whole muscle. And then if you subdivide it, so you cut it open and look inside, what we're gonna see is a lot of sheath-like layers. This is sheath-like layers of connective tissue, specifically dense irregular, and we call all this connective tissue fascia. You may have heard of this before or felt it before. If you've ever uh, given somebody a massage and you kind of feel the gristly parts in their shoulders maybe or their arms, you are actually feeling fascia, this connective tissue that's been laid down kind of improperly. And if you have enough fascia buildups of this connective tissue, uh, your muscles won't contract as successfully. So if you're like an athlete, you should get massages regularly, break up that fascia so your muscles contract properly. So as we look at the fascia, we talk about three main layers of fascia. The most outer part of the fascia surrounding the whole muscle is something called epimesium, literally translating to on top of the muscle tissue. Okay, so on top of epi, the muscle tissue. And then you look at this part actually surrounding something called the fascicle. So I'll point at it here and I'll point at it here. This is called perimesium. Perimesium means around, like perimeter, the muscle tissue. And then as we look at these fascicles, so this whole bundle of muscle tissue is called a fascicle. We see a lot of fascia sounding, right? So I think of this as like the muscular popsicle because inside the muscle fascicle we'll have actual muscle fibers, which are the muscle cells. So right, muscle fiber and muscle fiber literally translates to muscle cell. So if I refer to a muscle fiber, it is the muscle cell, cellular unit levels of organization. Now, inside each fascicle, we've got dozens and hundreds of these muscle fibers. So you can see how they're kind of protruding out of this muscle fascicle. And the fascicle itself is surrounded by something called endomesium, another connective tissue sheath. So if we go in order, basically the, fasci the fascia, we got uh, epimesium on the very outside, we got perimesium, and then we've got endomesium. Okay, wonderful. So the connective tissue is all well and good, but let's look at the muscle tissue that actually contracts, right? So now we're looking at cells that have these contractile units so we can actually move. Now, several things here I want you to know about. First off, it is a cell, so cells need a good blood supply. So we see right here, we've got a lot of capillaries. I mentioned them earlier because muscle tissue has a lot of blood supply. So right, capillaries, and this is going to supply you all that blood, okay? So muscle tissue, very highly active tissue, so it needs a lot of blood supply. In fact, so much so that it also has a ton of the powerhouse of the cell embedded within it, mitochondria. Now we know mitochondria, in this class, we talked about how it does that aerobic cellular respiration. That means we need oxygen and we're going to produce a lot of ATP from it. So the more mitochondria you have, the more efficient that muscle tissue is. So for example, if you're like running a marathon, those mitochondria are breaking down all that sugar, using oxygen, making sure we're making plenty of ATP for this muscle to contract. 
Furthermore, as we're talking about organelles inside of this cell, I know it's a very odd looking cell, right? This isn't your typical looking cell. We've got mitochondria and then we've got multiple nuclei. So these are nuclei. We know that the nuclei holds the DNA for the muscle cell or for any cell, uh, what have you. Now, why do we need a lot of nuclei in one muscle cell? Well, we know that nuclei contain DNA that can be transcribed onto mRNA that can then turn into proteins eventually. Now, proteins, structure and function of all your cells, I want to mention these here. If you subdivide it further and further and further into the most microscopic unit of the muscle, we will actually have two contractile proteins called actin as well as myosin. Okay, actin and myosin. And you're going to learn about the sliding filament theory in the next video and how these proteins interact. But what I'm trying to point out is the reason you have a lot of nuclei in the muscle cell, you need a lot of proteins to literally build the muscle so that it can contract. Makes sense. Now, how did I know that these were proteins? Well, if you followed this class, we know that it is because it ends in IN. Proteins always end in IN, which is kind of nice because proteins also end in IN. Wonderful. All right, so now let's talk about a few other cool organelles inside. Next one we have in this orange is called the sarcoplasmic reticulum. Sarcoplasmic reticulum. Now you may have heard of something similar to this in the endoplasmic reticulum. This is basically just the specialized form of endoplasmic reticulum for the muscle. I always remember sarco means in a way muscle, but it really means flesh but we're going to refer to muscles and flesh uh, synonymously. We're going to use it kind of as the same word. So what does the sarcoplasmic reticulum do? Well, this is a very important structure because it stores calcium ions. So I'm going to say Ca2 plus stores calcium ions. And you'll learn again in the next video how the calcium ions are the key. So I want you to write calcium key for contraction. Whenever the sarcoplasmic reticulum releases the calcium into uh, the sarcoplasm, so the fluid-like portion of the inside of the cell, the muscle contracts. So remember, if calcium is present, muscle contracts. Moving on, we need to, when we're contracting this whole muscle fiber, right, we need to basically tell the whole thing to contract at the same time, right? So in order to do that, we're going to use a specialized sort of transport tube throughout the muscle fiber itself called a T-tubule. I'm marking green. This is a T-tubule. And I want you to write that this will electrically couple, electrically couple all myofibrils. Okay, a couple things here. When I say electrically couple, I'm basically just talking about the whole cell gets excited at the same time. How do we do that? The T-tube, you will basically throw all the calcium all over the muscle cell at one moment, so the entire thing will accordion close so that we can contract it. We'll learn more about this when we're talking about action potentials in the neuromuscular junction. Now, I used the word myofibril here. That is not the same thing as a muscle fiber. These are different. The big picture, this big tube here, is the muscle fiber, right, the muscle cell. But then inside the muscle cell, we have these tubes that are called myofibrils. This is a play on words because myo means muscle, fiber always means just fiber in general. And then anytime you add ill to it or like a, uh, something like that, it means actually tiny. So it literally translates to the tiny muscle fiber inside of the muscle fiber. Isn't it kind of redundant and annoying? You see my Russian doll set joke at the beginning? Makes sense now, right? So when we're talking subdivisions, pull muscle, muscle fascicle, muscle fiber or muscle cell, and then myofibril. All right, so before we go into the myofibril here, I real quickly just want to mention the plasma membrane. So the outer part of this muscle cell right here is just called the sarcolemma. Sarcolemma. That just translates to the muscle lining, a.k.a the plasma membrane. Wonderful. Okay, so now let's dive into the myofibrils here. So we see several things here. It's once again a tube, but I want you to focus primarily on these dark bands. You see these dark bands here? These are called Z lines 
or Z disks. You may hear Z disks or Z lines, doesn't matter to me. And the whole of the muscle will contract because we're going to bring all of these Z disks closer together like an accordion. So essentially we're going to compress it, bring all of them closer together, and therefore the muscle will contract. So just think about, I've got two black markers here. If we got two Z disks here and we shorten them together, we're going to contract the whole muscle, okay? And then we relax it, muscle lengthens. Now, from Z disk to Z disk, we call this a sarcomere. Sarcomere. That translates to muscle unit. I want you to remember that the sarcomere is the contractile unit of the muscle. Contractile unit of muscle. Because if you subdivide everything down, the reason the muscle contracts is because the sarcomere shortens. Wonderful. Now, in the bands of the myofibrils, we've got two different sections. So I'm going to show you right here from blue to blue. This is actually called the A band. And I remember that the A band appears dark. So the word dark has an A in it. So remember the dark band, if you're looking under, like microscopically at this, you'll see a dark band, and that's the A band. Now, you also see some space in between A bands, right? Well, this space in between, I'll do an orange. This is called the I band. The I band. Okay, now I remember the I band appears light, okay, under a microscope. So if you're looking at this in a class and you see like dark line, light line, those are A band and I band. Okay, finally, we're into the proteins, right? So inside the myofibril, we've got actin and myosin. Now, break those words down. Myosin literally translates to the muscle protein. So muscle protein, this is going to be the one that will grab the actin and pull it to help bring those Z lines together. You'll learn about that in the next video. And the actin literally translates to the acted upon protein. Acted upon protein protein. So you can remember myosin, the muscle protein, is going to grab the actin. Wonderful. So that is muscle histology. Go ahead and click this video next to learn about the sliding filament theory and how these Z lines come together.